Welcome back from the break, everyone. Follow, right now, we have our, our, our keynote panel on the recent developments in Bitcoin Core, moderated by Brian Bishop, the CTO of Avanti Bank and Trust. He has a background in software engineering, Bitcoin, and genetic engineering slash biohacking. Thank you, John, or Brian, sorry. Thank you. It's good to be here. So um, I would also like to introduce the panelists. Uh, I'd like to ask each of uh, each of you to please introduce yourselves, um, and we can go from there. Let's start with uh, let's start with John. Hi, Brian. Um, my name is John Newbury. I am a Bitcoin protocol developer. I've been contributing to Bitcoin Core for um, almost five years now. I previously worked at Chaincode Labs in New York, and in the last year moved back to the UK and set up Brink which is a new organization for supporting Bitcoin developers. Great. I'm, I'm going to be asking about what that actually means in a, in a bit. But let's go to Gloria. Hello, I'm Gloria. Um, I'm relatively new, a little over a year contributing to Bitcoin Core. Just graduated college and joined Brink with John. I work on package map books. Hey. Great to have you. And uh, Peter. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Boella. Um I have been contributing to Bitcoin Core in various forms since around 2011, I think. Um, I'm currently at Chaincode Labs, and um, I work on uh, Bitcoin Core and protocol improvements uh, of various kinds. So I am also a Bitcoin Core contributor, although my contributions are a little bit different. And I'm actually talking about some of those later today. But first, let's go to a few of the introductory and warm-up questions, just so we're all on the same page for our, our audience. You know, what is Bitcoin Core? And when you say, you know, I work on Bitcoin Core, what does that actually mean? And you know, what is it? And, and what is that? And in, what's involved in that? Uh, let's start with uh, Peter. Yeah, sure. Um, so Bitcoin Core is the reference implementation of the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, it, it's uh, an evolution of the original code base written by Satoshi, um, currently maintained by a team of open source developers. Um, it, it is the most used full fully validating node software on the network. So uh, so what does it mean to be a Bitcoin Core developer? What, what does that actually mean in practice? Uh, it, it, it means you contribute to Bitcoin Core. There, there is no, you know, but <laughs> stamp you get, you are now a developer. Uh, it, it's just, you know, uh, it's an open source project and anyone is, is free to contribute. Uh, so, um, Gloria, wh why do you work on Bitcoin Core? It's a giant nerd snipe, really, is what it is. Um, I think as someone who, oh, I majored in computer science in college, it's like a lot of things. It's economics. It's really, really deep, interesting distributed systems topics. It's math, which I don't get to use anywhere else. Um, so honestly, working on anything else feels like a waste of time. So um, like Peter said, anyone can just contribute to Bitcoin Core because it's open source in however fashion they want. But I guess I'm lucky enough to do it full time for a living. So that's why I call myself a Bitcoin dev. But yeah, it's just fun. It's nice. It's great. <laughs> John, same question. Why why do you work on Bitcoin? Same answer, uh, because it's fascinating in many, many dimensions and spending time on other things seems like a waste of time. Um, people discover Bitcoin and, and certain people get sucked into this rabbit hole and just want to keep learning about Bitcoin. And the obvious end point of that is you stop just passively consuming information about Bitcoin and take part in the process of hopefully improving it and making it better and stronger and more likely to succeed. 
So I also consider myself very fortunate that I get to spend all of my time working on Bitcoin. And, and just for some context, maybe a few words about the different areas that um, y'all have worked on in Bitcoin Core. I mean, it's a, a big code base. Um, so, John? Um, well, I started out in 2016, and I was not a C++ developer. I had read one book about C++, um, but I had done quite a bit of work in Python in my previous jobs and felt much more comfortable in that language. And our test framework is written in Python. We have a functional test framework that spins up nodes and sends RPC calls to them and observes uh, P2P messages that are sent and received. And that's all written in Python. It's procedural. It, you know, it says, do this thing to this node and do this thing to this node and expect this thing from this node. Um, so my early contributions were going in and cleaning that up and making improvements there um, because that was where I was able to make the most impactful contribution given my skill set. Um, but over time, I, my C++ improved and naturally you want to um, have the most impact and work on the most interesting areas. And I've been drawn to the P2P part of Bitcoin Core over the last couple of years and consequently spend most of my time on P2P, but touching various other components in the code base. Um, but there's, you know, there's something for everyone there. There's, it's such a multifaceted project that you can go deep in lots of different areas. So let's define P2P in, in the context of Bitcoin Core. I mean, there's a node, there's a network. What, what does the peer-to-peer -peer networking layer do or, or what are you talking about? Is that, that's for me again? Yes. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah. Um, well, it's peer-to-peer. -peer, so there's no master node or there's, there's nothing in control, um, controlling the shape of the network. When you turn on a node, you have to somehow join um, and connect to other nodes that are serving you blocks and transactions. And the P2P part of the code handles all of that, handles connecting to other nodes, um, keeping track of what the network addresses of other nodes are, um, sending and receiving messages, parsing those messages. And if you receive a, some kind of inventory, so a transaction or a block, parsing that and passing it up to validation, which is our kind of the engine that drives Bitcoin. Um, so those different components have very, very different characteristics and they're interesting for different reasons, but they, they all offer very interesting challenges, I'd say. And Gloria, what about, what about you for areas of Bitcoin core that you've been drawn to or are particularly interested in? Yeah, I also started in functional tests, um, again, because I'm more familiar with Python than I was with C++. It's, it's a learning curve, I think, to ramp up to C++. Um, and then after I got more comfortable, I mostly hang out in mempool validation. Um, so I guess some of that is kind of tangential to P2P because um, you also have to decide like what to do with stuff that you receive from peers. But um, mostly mempool, mempool accept, <laughs> um, transactions handling. Um, yeah. Cool. And Peter, which, which areas of Bitcoin Core have you, let's actually ask, which ones have you not worked on? <laughs> the GUI. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, I did not start with the functional tests because they didn't exist when I discovered Bitcoin. Um, it, 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 it had some tests, but uh, yeah, just unit tests. Um, I think at, at the time I was mostly a C programmer um, and uh, I also ended up learning, at least initially learning C++ from the Bitcoin code base, which is at the time was perhaps maybe not the best place to learn it. Um, but well, the language has evolved and the code base has evolved. Uh, it, it's a lot more modern now. Um, things I've worked on, um, I have worked on certain aspects of the network uh, implementation, IPv6 support a while ago. Um, um, improvements to validation, um, 
implementation of SegWit, which I was a co-author of the proposal to. Um, the um, caching system that is used for keeping track of what coins, so what UTXOs, what coin, who, who owns which, which coins uh, for, uh, so the database behind that and, and uh, caching that in memory and something I worked on and many other things. Uh, I'm also a, a, a co-author and maintainer of libsecv 256k1, the cryptographic library that implements the ECDSA validation used and signing uh, and key generation used in Bitcoin Core and other projects. So I think another really interesting topic to, to bring up in this group is um, how developers can afford to work on Bitcoin Core and how that works. Uh, there's clearly uh, a, a strong group of at least 30 people who are regularly contributing. And, um, you know, it raises the question of how are they able to do that? It takes a lot of time to really dig in and especially to champion a, a pull request from proposal to you know, being merged can take quite a lot of effort. Um, so I, I guess I will turn to John for just an overview of, of how our developers funded and how do they afford to do this work? It's a, it's a good question and it's not specific to Bitcoin. Um, and I think it's a, a general question across open source projects that um, open source development is a non-rival and non-excludable good. It's a common good. Um, so anyone can take advantage of you know, Peter's idea of SegWit, um, even though they didn't pay Peter and there's no way to stop them from, from using that. Um, so the, the question is, how do, how do we pay people like Peter to continue coming up with great ideas and implementing them and testing them and fixing bugs? Um, we all want Bitcoin to succeed. And for that to happen, we need people like the people on this panel to continue working on Bitcoin. Um, over the last 10 years, we've seen quite a few different models for how to fund developers. Um, and generally, it's mostly coming from companies and individuals altruistically funding development. Um, Blockstream was a large funder of development over the last 10 years. Um, MIT DCI funds some developers. Various exchanges fund developers directly. So Square Crypto funds quite a few. BitMEX, OKCoin. Um, and I'd say today in, in 2021, we probably have the most healthy funding landscape that we've ever had for Bitcoin. Um, there are quite a few large exchanges and also individuals who are funding developers to work on Bitcoin. Uh, Brink, the organization that I set up um, last year, was founded to be another source of funding for protocol developers. Uh, we, we exist to support Bitcoin protocol developers, and we do that through two ways. One is a grants program for independent developers, established developers who have a proven track record of contributing to Bitcoin. Um, and we announced our first round of grantees last week. And our other program is a fellowship program to help develop and train future Bitcoin protocol developers. So Gloria is our first fellow. Um, I've been working with Gloria for about a year now. Um, and she has enormous potential and is very talented. Um, so it's, uh, it's obviously a pleasure to work with her and, and mentor her. But we, we want to continue doing that and finding really talented developers um, and training them up so they're able to make contributions to Bitcoin. Very interesting. Um, so Gloria, um, how, how, have you, um, how did you get involved with Brink and you know, how, how's it going from, from your perspective? It's going great. Uh, I met John and Amiti through Jonas at Chaincode because Chaincode has a really great residency which I think would be, as far as I know, the only other kind of training program for new like Bitcoin Core and, and Lightning developers. Um, so yeah, I got introduced to Amini and Chinko, or Amini and John February of last year, and then got super nerds night and couldn't stop looking at Bitcoin Core. Um, got comfortable with the functional tests, which I think gives you a way to 
make really tiny changes and then be able to observe it from uh, the functional tests. Um, and you can do that with various areas of the code base without knowing a lot of C++. And so I got like little things to do, like good first issues that Marco posts on the repo. And then over time, I was like, when I graduate, I don't wanna work at a corporate job. <laughs> I wanna work on Bitcoin. Um, and so John was like, oh, what a coincidence. I just happened to be setting up this organization that has this program that works perfectly for your situation. So I was like, please, 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 can I do it? Um, and very lucky that some sponsors were uh, happy to support that. And John was willing to take me on as his mentee. One of the- It's nice. One of the questions that um, doesn't get answered often because it's so ridiculous is can't Bitcoin core developers support themselves because they get, you know, a cut or a, a part of, of Bitcoin? Um, you know, why why talk about you know Bitcoin developer funding? Um, so maybe uh, Peter can shed some light on how that works. Yeah, I it it it. It's an obvious answer, of course, but I don't think it's a particularly good one because, first of all, it, it screws incentives, right? Um, if if you look at the cryptocurrency market, and be honest, and and look at how uh, exchange rates evolve and try to correlate that with technical capabilities of projects, there's at least in the short medium term, there's almost no correlation, like. Uh, so the, the, the problem you get, I think, if developers are funded directly by what is ultimately the exchange rate of the currency they create, um, they really get a, an incentive to overpromise. And you know, you know the, the, our, our interest should be in, in long-term evolution and not short-term price speculation. Um, <clears throat> that I so um, uh, for example Blockstream uh, which is a company I co-founded in, in 2014 um, does have a program where uh, part of the salary is paid out in Bitcoin so there is some some uh, in, incentive but it is, it's of course not given up from <laughs> uh, to be clear so um, uh, the, there, there are various models there, but uh, I, I think ultimately you, you want to have a model where funding comes externally. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the Blockstream Bitcoin grants, that was, that was a private market function, but yeah, um, very interesting model. So um, one more topic on the, on the topic of Bitcoin developers and Bitcoin Core is uh, the Bitcoin Core PR Review Club, um, in particular because I believe uh, next week Gloria will be hosting one of those. Um, so perhaps describe what it is and why everyone in the audience should be attending them regularly. Yeah, the Bitcoin Core PR Review Club is something that John started. Um, basically every week we pick a Bitcoin Core, sometimes Peter, uh, PR uh, that you know, touches some area of the code base. Um, and we review it together on Wednesdays. Um, and the host, so that would be me next week, also comes up with a list of questions and notes so that if you're new to reviewing PRs or you haven't really looked at the Quinn Core that much, you kind of have an idea of what questions you should be asking while you're looking at the code. Um, so I think Bitcoin Core is a bit more uh, security centric when we're reviewing a new PR because again, anyone can make a PR and if the network crashes, um, a lot of people will be very angry. Um, so we'll ask questions like, what are the memory bounds? Like what can an attacker do to trigger some behavior? Like what is the worst case scenario that can happen? Or like, why is this C++ syntax being used, for example? 
Um, why is this correct? You know, what, what kind of tests can we add to add more confidence that this is a good change? Um, so next week we're talking about rebroadcast and everyone should come because the way that I see it is a lot of people own Bitcoin, but a not a lot of not a lot of people participate in the don't trust verify the code part. Um, so a lot of people on Twitter will be like, yeah, Bitcoin's indestructible. Like governments should try to ban it and we'll be totally fine because my Raspberry Pi 3 is gonna run a Bitcoin node. Um, but like, unless you've actually looked at the code and verified for yourself, like, yeah, I think this is safe. I'm comfortable storing my wealth in this. Um, I don't think you're a real cyberpunk. I think you're trusting and not verify. Um, so I think getting started in reviewing the code, particularly through PR Review Club, is a good way to get started on that. And I think PR Review Club is designed to be very beginner friendly and anyone can ask questions. And you know, there's no prerequisites, which is really nice. But um, despite it being a very safe space, like Peter and John and a lot of very, very expert people are often there to answer questions. So it's a really nice place to hang out on Wednesdays at 17 UTC. Great. So now on to some more uh, technical topics involved in Bitcoin Core. I would like to actually start with Peter on uh, LibSecP 256K1. And if I was to say that it was a, a special piece of code, um, I would ask why and you know what kind of work went into it and, and why would someone like me consider it well-crafted and, and what does it do? So um, history, I guess, is um, Bitcoin for reasons unknown uh, uses this particular elliptic curve based cryptography that at, at the time was really not uh, not used in many places. So, I mean, there were implementations in standard libraries like OpenSSL and that is what Bitcoin used at the time. Um, but OpenSSL had problems. Um, some of those due to just it being a very old code base, um, others because it really not being designed for consensus critical um, behavior. I guess I should explain what that means. Um, you, usually when we're talking about a digital signature scheme or, or any kind of cryptography, but specifically for digital signatures, um, you want the property, of course, that an honest user can produce a signature that everybody considers valid. And someone who doesn't have the private key does not have the ability to con construct a signature that anyone uh, considers valid. But um, a property that is usually not talked about is it should not be possible for anyone, including people with a private key, to produce a signature that is valid to some validators and not to others. Um, and in, in Bitcoin, we really need this because um, the whole network needs to get agreement on whether a particular block and a particular transaction are valid. If, if anyone disagrees, you, the network splits in two pretty literally. Um, so uh, OpenSSL had, had issues regarding that. And uh, in particular, we discovered uh, somewhere in 2014, I think I discovered that, that there was a slight difference between the 32-bit and 64-bit versions of OpenSSL that could have been used to um, split the network in two by crafting a particular signature that would be valid to, to some but not others. And at the time, me and a few other contributors had been working on this library, LibSecP 226K1, which I'm going to call LibSecP for from now on. Um, that, that started as, as a, an experiment to see how, uh, how to use the sp special properties that this elliptic curve, because it was actually designed to be particularly efficient to implement, but these optimizations were not implemented uh, in OpenSL, for example. So I had started with this library uh, to see that as an experiment and I grew further, um, got contributions from Craig Maxwell, Peter Detman, uh, lots of others that, that 
really improved it and it, it, it is very well tested, uh, for example. Uh, it's, uh, so yeah. patents have played a role in this, unfortunately, in, in at least two cases that I can recall. One is the Schnorr patent, and then second is uh, um, a more recent one that expired. And, um, yeah, GLV, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about, actually. So, um, the, the, the SECP curve is specifically selected to enable a certain optimization, the so called GLV uh, endomorphism. GLV are the initials of the authors Gallant, Lambert, Vanstone, I think. Um, but this, this technique was patented. And um, so while it was actually implemented in LIPSECP, that, that was the reason it was created in the first place, um, it was disabled in standard builds and Bitcoin Core didn't use it because uh, it was patented and didn't want to expose Bitcoin users to that kind of risk. But that patent expired. Uh, in many places in the world, but it last expired in the US December 2020. And since then, we just flipped the switch and uh, it's now enabled by default, giving a, I don't know, something like a 30% speed up for validation. Um, That's actually a, a big improvement. Do, um, you know, for, for context, um, how many uh, improvements of that order of magnitude are left? I mean, we've <laughs> um, so that there's an, another one that's uh, very recently was done where, where we improved the uh, um, algorithm used for computing modular inverses uh, using uh, an algorithm from a paper by Daniel J. Bernstein and Bo Yin Yang, uh, Safe GCD. Um, it's a really interesting history there, how, how uh, while working on tests for, for this, um, you know, our contributor, Greg Maxwell, was, was trying to do mutation testing, like, uh, basically intentionally introducing bugs in the code and see if the tests catch it. And he encountered one that the tests didn't catch. And uh, looking at it a bit more, it's like, oh, it, it could be that this actually doesn't break it, but maybe just makes it slower. So we try benchmarking it and it's like consistently faster. It, it, it's like changing a, a one into a two somewhere. It's like a very tiny change and, and it, it, uh, it, it was faster. And we had been working on, on a technique just to, to prove the, the worst case runtime of this algorithm. And, so it was fairly easy to adapt it and see, well, does this modified algorithm also have this? And you know, we very quickly could prove that it was something like 20% faster in the worst case, uh, which is a, a really remarkable uh, discovery. Th this, isn't, this isn't used yet, but uh, we're, we're working on it too. Uh, so, yeah. Very interesting. interesting. <laughs> you know, even, even on, um, you know, that's a good segue to the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, layer because uh, uh, improvements are, are, can be found everywhere, not just in signature validation or, or other uh, cryptography. Um, you know, actually one thing I wanted to ask about um, to John was, um, you know, I, I was looking at release notes and I see Tor uh, V3 is going to be supported soon or is. And, um, you know, I was just wondering if you could talk about that and maybe uh, uh, Tor V3, uh, the addresses. The new uh, onion, perhaps is that supported? I don't, I don't even know. Yes, I believe that's supported from the latest major release, zero point twenty one, which was uh, released a few months ago. And the story there is that um, the Tor network uses a certain address format. Um, it used to be version two of that address format, which had addresses of a certain length, and that was supported by Bitcoin Core. And um, Tor then came out with a new address format, version three, which had longer addresses. And version two was deprecated and has been, I believe, now disabled. Um, so if you want to connect to the Tor network, you need to be able to support these longer addresses. The Bitcoin P2P network gossips the network addresses of nodes on the network. So when you join as a node, 
you connect to a peer and you say, tell me, tell me about some of the nodes you know on the network so I can connect to them. And that is communicated through an adder message. And that adder message um, only had enough room for a, a V2 uh, um, address or an IPv6 or a, a Tor V2 address. And so it couldn't fit a Tor V3 address. And so without changing that peer-to-peer -peer protocol in Bitcoin, um, we wouldn't be able to gossip the addresses of Tor V3 nodes and Bitcoin users would no longer be able to connect to the Tor network. Um, as well as that change in the P2P protocol, there were other changes internally in Bitcoin Core to make it able to support these longer addresses. Um, and that work was first proposed, I think, by Vladimir, uh, maybe two or three years ago, and then worked on by various contributors. Um, Fasil, I, I think, contributed most of the code um, in the end, and, and many, many people reviewed those changes and it got merged in um, shortly before the v0.21 um, split and released in v0.21. So um, people often are, it's, it's a good question um, thinking about that because people often ask, well, Bitcoin's done, right? So what, why do we need to continue paying developers to work on Bitcoin? Well, the world continues to change around Bitcoin. And so without developers to propose these changes, test them and review them, um, you actually lose functionality because the world is changing around you. So without doing anything, Bitcoin would have lost the ability to connect through the Tor network. So um, yet another reason you should pay your local Bitcoin developer. Uh, if I can interject very quickly, like it, it, on the topic of, of, of funding, we're, we're of course talking here about Bitcoin Core specifically as this is a Bitcoin Core panel, but uh, Funding and development and research is 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 much wider in the Bitcoin ecosystem, right? We 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 need people developing wallets and services and and you know layers on top and and so on. Uh, not really the topic here, but I want to mention that that the world is much bigger than than just a piece of software work we're working on. That's very true. So. Um... Let's go to Gloria, uh, because we're on the topic of peer-to-peer -peer improvements in Bitcoin Core. So I want to ask about mempool uh, rebroadcast and what exactly the subject is of the forthcoming uh, Bitcoin Core PR Review Club. Yeah, rebroadcast is a media's project. Um, its goal is to improve privacy in the linkage between wallet addresses and IP addresses. So like there's various projects that introduce like zero knowledge proofs and ring signatures that uh, improve the privacy of transactions. But if you're able to link which IP address broadcasted the transaction, um, then all of that is moot because you have a lot of information about the transaction origin. Um, but beyond just initial broadcast, which you can try to hide through Tor and various other peer-to-peer -peer protocol improvements like Dandelion, there's also the issue of rebroadcasting. So previously, or I think still currently, um, the Bitcoin Core wallet will rebroadcast a transaction of its own if it's not included in a block um, like when it's supposed to. So, I mean, this is fairly intuitive. It's like, okay, maybe transaction relay failed at some point or someone's censoring it, or you know, the fee rate was fluctuating. So we want to rebroadcast it and it should be like most intuitively the responsibility of the wallet, but that is a huge privacy leak because you can just tell whose transaction it is. If so, oh, you broadcasted it twice, it's your transaction. Um, so rebroadcast is a project to make everyone kind of shoulder the responsibility of rebroadcasting transactions so that the behavior for the wallet's own transaction and anyone else's is indistinguishable so that you don't have a privacy leak there. Um, so the PR that Amidi has opened that we're reviewing in PR Review Club next week uh, introduces the selecting mechanism for, okay, what kind of heuristics can we use to decide whether or not a transaction should be rebroadcasted? Um, how can we make sure that we're not spamming the network uh, with these rebroadcasts and, you know, all kinds of very interesting trade-offs between performance and um, network bandwidth and privacy. And it's very interesting. So yeah, okay. Anyway, that's, that's rebroadcast. Um, 
it's a very cool peer-to-peer -peer privacy implementation. <laughs> so um, question to the panelists uh, would be, are there any other peer-to-peer uh, -peer network layer improvements that are, are worthy of mentioning that you would like to describe that are either on the horizon or even recently implemented? Package relay. <laughs> What was that, Gloria? Package Relay? What's that? Uh, oh, so glad that you mentioned that. Yeah, Package Relay is a good one. <laughs> Should I describe it? <laughs> yes, yes. OK. Um, well, in short, packet, right now we have transaction relay, so unconfirmed transactions, not transactions in blocks. Um, right now we broadcast and relay transactions individually. Um, and package relay in short is to be able to broadcast groups of transactions. And you're like, okay, that sounds really dumb or fairly simple. Um, but there are uh, important use cases for that. So for example, um, fee bumping is not only a way for users to like express, I want this to be mined in a block more sooner, but also really important for security because sometimes not only are you interested in having a higher time preference, for example, but um, you are trying to meet a time lock. Um, so for example, if you're closing a lightning channel, often you'll have two spending paths. One is like, okay, within a certain period of time, the person uh, can be like, oh, wait, hold on. You are trying to cheat me out of my money and closing the channel in a different balance than I agreed to. So I'm going to sweep the funds. Uh, but that only lasts for like a day or three days or two weeks or whatever. And then if they don't respond in time, then the attacker will be able to get away with their, um, their extra money. Um, so this is an example where being able to fee bump in order to express urgency in a transaction is actually a security issue. Um, well, what does this have to do with package relay? Well, um, the way that miners select transactions is they look at their own mempool and they're like, okay, I want the highest B ones and then I'm gonna mine these. But in order for you to get your transaction to a miner, unless you're like buddies with them, you're like, hey, can you, can you include this transaction is by stepping through mempools of other nodes and then eventually trickling the transaction to a miner. But then when you are your own node, um, you're interested in having a mempool that gives you a good idea of like what transactions will be in the next block and also protecting your mempool from having like garbage in it. So there's a lot of DOS protections um, to prevent some random peer on the network from like churning through a lot of transactions in your mempool to effectively make it useless. Um, this, this is important for many reasons. Um, so when we're talking about fee bumping, you have a limited mempool size, again, for these like DOS reasons. Um, and so when the fee market goes up and let's say your minimum mempool fee is like 10 sats per vbyte, you're not going to um, accept any transactions that are below the base fee rate of 10 sats per vbyte. But we do have a method of fee bumping a transaction called child pays for parent, where if your parent transaction is like two sats per vbyte and you spend from it with like a 100 sats per vbyte transaction, then they will be packaged within the mempool. And so this bumps the fee rate up to like 50 or something. Um, however, because of DOS protections, we won't consider the fee bumping unless both transactions meet our base mempool policy. Um, and so unless you have some way of saying, hey, please consider this parent and child together and validate them as a unit and consider their fee rate as a package, the mempool code will just be like, oh, too low fee rate. I don't even want to look at it. Um, and so in this case, if your closing transaction where you're trying to escape from like your counterparty cheating you is a two sat per view or a very low transaction fee, um, you're stuck. Um, and 
either you have to find a way to get it to the miner directly or like basically there isn't a way for the basic user or for the general user to fee bump in this situation. You can't RBF it if you know um, you don't have control over all the inputs. You can't RBF it if there are already other transactions that are spending it. And you know, there's all kinds of considerations. But the goal of package relay is to make this fee bumping more accurate um, and safer. And also maybe we can get rid of orphans and whatnot. But I think that would be the general use case is improving child pays for parent fee bumping. Um, you know, that actually brought back a lot of memories. I That's right, that the relay of CPFP and parent and child, that's right. Yeah, there's some issues there, right? Okay. <laughs> yes, that would be very good if that was improved. Um, yeah. Interesting, okay. Stuck transactions. Yeah, I think okay. as mempools start to fill up more, it'll be more of an issue. Very interesting. Uh, so the audience is welcome to submit questions. Um, while we wait for additional questions from the audience, I would like to move to another topic, which is uh, reproducible builds. And so I was thinking, let's ask uh, Peter for a description of reproducible builds and why that might be interesting to a project like Bitcoin Core, and then we can move on to like what's being done about it. Yeah, so um, Bitcoin Core actually, I think kind of, pioneered this, this idea of, of having reproducible builds uh, a number of years ago. And the, the issue is, um, philosophically, um, for example, Bitcoin Core doesn't have a auto-update mechanism because the, the, the idea is the user should uh, intentionally decide to, to you know, it, it, Power to the user. The, the, the user should be in charge of, of what software and, and ultimately what rules of the network they demand. And giving developers or anyone distributing software the power to automatically update is, is sort of at odds with that, um, as they could sort of force new rules onto the network, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Um, so for that reason, there's no auto update intentionally. Um, but also as, as a user, how do you know that a binary you download actually corresponds to the open source source code uh, that is being reviewed? Like, you know, you can have the question, well, is that software really uh, uh, reviewed? But um, at least, you know, many eyes make all bugs shallow. And so the, we, we really want a way of, of telling our users, look, our, our release binaries that you can download actually match our source code. And in order for that, to, to achieve that, we have this mechanism where all the release build are built in sort of a virtual machine with a very controlled environment and, and various tweaks to, to make it exactly reproducible. So you yourself at home can build the Bitcoin Core releases and you will get a bit for bit identical result with, with the binaries. And so um, our release process consists of many people building these and everybody signing off of, yep, this is the binary I get from this source code. And um, yeah, so that, that, that's something uh, that has been worked on a long time ago. You know, that actually directly goes into one of the questions from the audience, which was, uh, concerns regarding um, the risk of, of updating and changing Bitcoin and Bitcoin Core over time. And uh, deterministic builds certainly are, are one mechanism of mitigating uh, those types of risks, more from an operational standpoint with builds and distributing builds, perhaps. But it's an interesting one, anyway. Uh, let's see. Uh, there, there were actually two questions from the audience in that in that uh, topic. The other one was, uh, other than rigorous testing, are there any mechanisms in place in Bitcoin to mitigate the potential impact of an introduced bug? And uh, uh, my understanding of the answer is it's mostly testing, but users and um, the, the ability of the ecosystem to be resilient and respond to, to changes. 
Well, and, and, and also rigorous review, of course, right? Bitcoin Core is intentionally very conservative, I think, uh, in, in, in terms of, and frustratingly so uh, at, at times. Um, but yes, of course, the, ultimately the protection against uh, bugs and, and unintended consequences is having many people look at it and, and you can help. Yeah, I think um, what Peter said there is true. It, it can be frustrating and the process of contributing to Bitcoin Core, I think is very different from, from many other projects. Um, and if I go and look at other projects on, on GitHub, other open source projects, I'm sometimes quite shocked at how, how little review and how little test changes seem to get before they're merged. Um, Bitcoin has a very high standard of review in general and our testing continues to get better and better every year um, there's been a lot of effort recently on fuzz testing which is a, a different way of testing making sure that um, the code is doing what we want it to and doesn't have vulnerabilities um, and like peter said it's it's the best way to get involved review test well i think we're just about out of time i want to thank the panelists thank you for taking time out of your busy days to uh join me on this panel it's been really interesting thank you thanks Brian.